Hey everyone, welcome to Seabreeze. I'm Joanna and I'm the Outreach and Serving Director here. It's great to have you with us today. Worship is going to begin in just a few moments, but before we get to that, I wanna encourage you how you can stay engaged and participate in the worship service today. If you have kids, we have kids and student resources available on our website. There's something for kids of all ages. Follow along with the message on your Uversion app on your phone. You can take notes on there. As we think through how we can each participate in worship today, we created three discussion questions for you to think through during the message. Here are the three questions. What stood out to you? What do you think of the unique command given to husbands and the one given to wives? This question will make more sense once you hear the message. And the third question is what is the next step you can take? For those of you watching with others in the room, we encourage you to discuss these questions after the message. And for those of you who are watching it on your own, maybe text a friend and ask them to discuss the questions later today. We will have these on the notes on the Uversion app, available on our website where this message is posted, and then the questions will come up on the screen at the end of the service. Again, we're so glad you're with us today. Let's sing a few songs together. Sing, I was buried beneath my shame. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The only you Jesus, when I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious state You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness 
into your glorious day. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. You call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Stay. You call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day.
your very body began to breathe out of the silence the warm in my ear declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living As a way to connect in person this summer, we're offering activity groups that will be happening outdoors during the month of July. Since we're not yet able to gather on campus together, we wanted to create a safe way for people to connect. We'll have a couple walking groups, surfing, hiking, pickleball, gardening, and a campus spruce up at Seabreeze. If you're interested in any of these groups, make sure to fill out the form on our website. Even though we're all in different places right now, we wanted to create a way to connect with you. This is why we created our connection card. We're going to be filling out in just a few moments, but before we do that, I wanted to explain to you why we have our connection card. First off, we wanna know how we can be praying for you. So on the connection card, there is a space there that you can fill in your prayer request. If you're new to Seabreeze, we would love to know so that we can send you a gift. We are so glad that you're visiting with us online. And when we can gather again in person, we would love to meet you then. Seeing who has joined us online today is also very encouraging for us. So to get the connection card, take out your phone and text Seabreeze to 474747. And then you can click on the link. Start by filling out your name. If you're new to Seabreeze, you can let us know there. And also if you're interested in wanting to know more about following Christ, baptism, or groups, you can let us know on the card. And then at the end of the card is a space for you to share a prayer request. So again, text Seabreeze to 474747 to get to the connection card. Let's take a few moments to fill it out. I now want to highlight an opportunity for you to serve. Seabreeze is hosting another blood drive with the American Red Cross and it's coming up soon on Monday, July 13th. We're still looking for about 20 more donors. Donating blood is such a great way to serve our community, especially during this time. If you're interested in donating, go to our website and click on Serve Others Daily. And then there will be a form that you can fill out on our website. If you want to give today, you can do that through our website. Again, we're so glad that you're participating with us today. I think that you'll find a lot of help from today's message. We're in a series called Be Different. Our guide for this series has been the book of 1 Peter. This book is a letter from the Apostle Peter to Christians, and it was written shortly after the time of Christ, right after Christ's life. And in this letter, Peter He's urging those that he's writing to to live a different kind of life. And he's not telling them to be different just for the sake of being different. He's telling them to be different 
because they are to be holy. We read this earlier in chapter one. It says, but just as he who has called you is holy, so you also be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, holiness is moral perfection. And the standard for holiness is God himself. And that's why it says in this passage, just as he who has called you is holy, and why it says, be holy because I am holy. The call to be holy, it's really a call to be like God. This perfect holiness here is something that only God could ever achieve. But Peter, he's writing to a group of people who have been made holy. They've been made holy, not because of any of their own effort, but they've been made holy by Jesus. They have put their trust in Jesus. They've put their trust in Jesus, who is God in flesh, who died on the cross in their place to take their sin on himself and then to give them his holiness. And so now, having had their sins paid for by Jesus, they are free to live lives that are different and lives that reflect that holiness that they've received from Jesus. But there are two problems. The first problem is that they still live in a world that is dominated by sin. They live in a world that is not holy. The second problem is that even though they've been made holy, they still have hearts that are inclined to sin. We read in chapter one, verse 14, it says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Now an implication of this is that they are still drawn to these evil desires that we read about of a time before knowing Jesus. As Christians today, we're very familiar with both of these tensions that they're experiencing as well. We know what it is like to live in a world that has very little regard for holiness. We also know what it's like to struggle with strong and powerful inclinations towards sin. But 1 Peter, this book, it's written to help those of us who have been made holy by Jesus live live lives that reflect that holiness. In the passage that we're going to look at today, Peter, he turns his attention to the topic of marriage. You see, holiness, it's a practical thing. It's not some abstract idea that never touches down on real life. And marriage, what we're going to talk about today, is one of those areas in life where the rubber really meets the road. In fact, if I told you that I had experienced something that completely changed my life, but it had really no impact or only a little impact on my marriage, then you would probably doubt if what I had experienced had actually changed my life. And rightly so, you'd be right to doubt that. So Peter gives instructions for husbands and for wives on how they can have a different kind of marriage. And he instructs them, he instructs us, by drawing our attention to some key differences between men and women and between husbands and wives. He highlights these differences not so that we can erase them or so that we can downplay the differences, but so that husbands and wives can grow in ways in holiness that are uniquely male and uniquely female. So today, we're gonna look at two of those differences and we're also gonna look at two commands that he gives, one for husbands, and one for wives. The first difference that we're gonna see here is that God has given women a unique value. Wives have a unique value. And this unique value, it's actually built upon a common value that both men and women share before God. We first read about that common value in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible in the very first chapter. Genesis 1, 27 says this, so God created man in his own image, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So in the beginning, God created man and woman in his own image. And it's being created in the image of God that gives both genders an incredible and an equal value before God. And that value that he's given to both men and women, it's far above all other creation, everything else he created, men and women, both genders, male and female, far above all the rest of creation in value. We also see this equal value show up in our passage today in 1 Peter. In chapter three, verse seven, talking to husbands, it says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. 
Wives in this verse are referred to in two ways, as you see. One of those is as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life. Heirs with you, that's something that could also be translated as joint heirs. The idea is that being equal, that of being equal participants. Husbands and wives are equal participants in the gracious gift of life, like we read here. So this refers to an equal value of men and women. The other way that wives are referred to in this verse is as the weaker partner. And this refers to the unique value of women. So how is that? We read something like heirs with you or joint heirs, and that sounds good, that sounds great. But when we read weaker partner, at first glance, that seems more like an insult than an honor. So what, what's actually going on here? What is Peter driving at? Is he just talking about physical strength? Is that what he means by weaker partner? To some degree, that might be the case. There's an element where Peter is acknowledging that men tend to have more physical strength than women. But there's something much deeper than physical strength at play here in this verse. The phrase that's translated weaker partner, it literally means fragile vase. So I wanna show you this picture. I took this um, this morning. These are just kind of some containers that I collected from around my house. As you look at this picture, one of these is in the fragile vase category. I'll let you go ahead and see if you can figure out which one it is. But one of these is in that fragile, ga- fragile vase category. The others, they're not. One of these is something that's gonna be passed down to our children and maybe our children's children. The others, definitely not. One of these gets wrapped in six inches of bubble wrap when we move. And the others, obviously, they do not. So this phrase, weaker partner, what it's speaking of is it's speaking of something precious. It speaks of something that is to be treasured, something that is to be protected. It speaks of something that is, is worthy, as it says here, of great respect and great honor. And so the Bible teaches that there's this unique value that God has given to women. But our experience also confirms that on top of what the Bible teaches. Just think of any wedding that you've been to. I realize COVID-19, all of us might not have been to a wedding for a while, but if you can remember back, think back to a wedding that you've been to. Where are all of the eyes? Where's everyone's attention? Are they split 50-50 between the bride and the groom? No, not at all. All of the eyes, they're focused on the bride. And even the ones that are looking at the groom, if you're looking at the groom, odds are you're just looking at the groom to figure out what he's thinking about the bride. And the groom, he doesn't complain about this. He doesn't say, you know, I'm really upset about this. I want my share of the attention. I want my share of the honor here. No, him more than anyone else, his eyes are glued onto his bride. And so this passage, it's not written to women to rub it in their face that they probably can't deadlift as much as their husbands. This whole verse, it's not even addressed to women. This whole verse is actually addressed to husbands, and it's written to remind them of the incredible and the unique value of their wives before God. Husbands are to love our wives. We are to treasure our wives, and we're to treat them with the honor that is due to the most valuable thing in our lives. And one of the things that this means for us practically is that we honor our wives when we lead in sacrifice. For an example, of how we are to lead and sacrifice the Bible, it points us directly to Jesus himself. We're told in Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now the Bible refers to the church as the bride of Christ. And this passage tells husbands to love their wives by following the example of Christ and how he loved the church. And it's not just an optional example to follow. This is a dead serious command for husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And how did he go about loving the church? He gave himself up for her. He sacrificed. Now, early on in a relationship, sacrifice comes pretty easy to men. We're eager to make a good impression and we're eager to demonstrate our love through sacrifice. But then, As time goes on, marriage, it's no longer just about two people standing on a stage with vows and confessing their love for one another. 
No, as time goes on, marriage becomes about two people and bills and kids and stress from work and deadlines and late night trips to urgent care. And in this context, sacrifice, it begins to feel much less romantic and much more actually sacrificial. But it's when we don't feel like sacrificing that we have the greatest opportunity, husbands, to imitate Christ who laid down his life for us, not because he felt like suffering, but because of his love for us and out of obedience to God. Now, of course, marriage is full of sacrifice. It's full of sacrifice on both sides. Sacrifice on both sides of a marriage, it's inevitable and it's really necessary. But when it comes to husbands, husbands, when we choose to lean in, when we choose to lean in and sacrifice, when we choose to be the first to sacrifice, what we're really doing is we are agreeing with God. We are agreeing with God about the incredible and the unique value of our wives. And when we pause and when we ask, what sacrifice can I make today that will bless my wife, that will benefit her, then we're really growing our marriages in holiness and we're really blessing our wives at the same time. So we see that God has given women a unique value. And as we turn our attention to men now, to husbands, we'll see that God has given them a unique accountability. Husbands have a unique accountability. To be accountable, it means to be required or expected to justify actions or decisions. And as individuals, we're all accountable. We are all accountable to God for our actions and for our decisions. No one is exempt from this. But God has given husbands a unique accountability in that they will not only answer for their individual actions and their individual decisions, but for the actions and the decisions of their marriages and their families as well. Just as husbands are called in scripture to follow Christ's example by leading in sacrifice, they're also called to follow his example and lead in responsibility. Here's what we read in Ephesians 5.23. It says, for, husb- for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Now, when we read a phrase like the husband is the head in the Bible, we think that that means that he's the one who gets his way. What it really means is that he is the one who carries the overall weight of responsibility for the marriage. And where God gives this additional responsibility, he also gives an additional accountability. So while husbands and wives each have their own accountability and their own responsibility, husbands have an additional layer of each. But men tend to dislike accountability. We tend to dislike accountability. It can seem like like a chain or like a burden that we don't want to bear. And so to rid ourselves of the accountability that we frankly find obnoxious, we try to get rid of the responsibility and we hope that the accountability will go away with it. Sometimes we do this explicitly, but often we just ease off and we kind of passively detach from the responsibility. The result of this is that our responsibilities are left just floating in no man's land. Now, we may not do this at work where a paycheck is on the line, but it's much easier to get away with when it comes to responsibilities like the health or the romance in our marriage, or when it comes to raising or disciplining our children, or how about this one, when it comes to whether or not our finances actually honor God or major family decisions. And when we, when we back off on these responsibilities, we're really putting our wives in a bind. We're putting them in an awkward situation where they have to ask, am I just gonna sit by and am I gonna risk watching this ship sink? Or am I gonna take that responsibility for myself? And often, wives choose to take their husband's responsibility in addition to their own. And because as husbands, this actually lines up with what we wanted in the first place, we tend to not push back too much. And this can become a permanent arrangement. A husband's attitude can easily become, you know, since you seem to care so much more about my responsibilities than I do, then sure, go ahead. You can have them. I really wasn't too keen on them in the first place. It's not a big loss. And our hope is that by jettisoning these responsibilities, we're also detaching ourselves from the accountability that goes with it. 
But there's a problem here. And the problem is that the accountability doesn't transfer. Husbands now are left accountable for things they're not taking responsibility for, while wives are left with responsibility for things for which someone else is actually going to be held accountable. So when this dynamic plays out, as it often does, what is a husband to do about it? What about a wife? What is a wife to do about it when finding herself in this situation? Well, that brings us to our final point here, which is that both husbands and wives have a unique command. They both have a unique command. In 1 Peter, both husbands and wives are told to be something. And that something provides practical handholds for actions, both for husbands and for wives. Husbands, the thing that they're told to be is to be considerate. Husbands are told to be considerate. We go back to 1 Peter 3, 7 to see this. It says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Husbands are told to be considerate as they live with their wives. And this may seem like a simple thing or a basic concept, but it's actually revolutionary in that it actually gives husbands, it gives men a picture of what biblical masculinity looks like. You see, our culture tends to just see two options for masculinity. On one side is passive and unassertive, and then on the other side is harsh or overbearing. And there's a reason why these are the prevailing narratives of masculinity in our culture. There's actually a reason why, why we consider these things to be the two options. And that's that men actually do tend to kind of oscillate between these two, passivity or laziness on one side and harshness or what's popularly called toxic masculinity on the other side. And so we look at these two extremes and we think where on this spectrum is a positive version of masculinity. And seeing none, our culture, just rejects the concept of masculinity altogether. But considerate masculinity, like what we read about here, it isn't just a middle ground on this passive to harsh spectrum. Considerate masculinity, it's really a flat out rejection of both. You see, considerate masculinity, it rejects passivity. It considers my wife and it asks, am I putting her in an awkward spot by neglecting my responsibilities? It asks, do I treat her like a wife, like a valued and an equal partner, or do I treat her like my mommy? Do I hope that if I do nothing, that she's going to step in and she's going to solve all of the problems of our family? Consider it masculinity. It proactively thinks about the marriage. It proactively thinks about the family, and it, it's not afraid to ask tough questions about both of those things. Considerate masculinity also rejects harshness. It rejects passivity. It also rejects harshness. Colossians 3.19 says this. It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, a key here, a key to understanding this is that considerate masculinity, it listens. It listens and it asks questions. It considers the thoughts and the feelings of others. It doesn't assume that it always has all the answers or is always right. It doesn't operate in a state of anger or agitation. And it really thinks about the words that it says. It thinks about the words before it speaks. And it, doesn't, it does its best to choose words that are helpful and kind and reject words that are harsh. And it's actually really difficult to walk this line, to walk this line between passive and harsh. Thankfully, God has given us a built-in mechanism for determining when we step out of line. As we go back to 1 Peter 3, 7, we see husbands, in the same way, be considerate and live with your wives as you live with your wives. Why? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. Where we read here, so that nothing will hinder your prayers, that tells us that there's a correlation going on here between how we treat our wives and our ability to pray. Several weeks ago, I experienced this. I had gotten a text from somebody about an urgent situation asking me to pray for them. And so I decided, you know what? I'm just going to stop. I'm going to pray right now. So I went to pray. But before I could even begin, I, I just, I couldn't start. I couldn't start praying. And the reason for that is that God had just put his finger 
on a situation from earlier that morning. Earlier in that morning, I had been both passive and harsh with my wife. I had been passive about a situation and then I had been harsh to cover up that passivity. And so I felt like a horrible hypocrisy in that moment as I went to pray for my friend. I felt like a horrible hypocrisy to just blatantly disregard what God had said about how I should treat my wife and then come to him in prayer with that situation still looming and still unresolved. And maybe you found yourself in a similar spot. If you have, you know that it feels terrible. It feels just awful, but it's actually an incredible blessing. It's a prompt from God to confess our sin to him and to seek our wives' forgiveness and to move forward, return to prayer, and to relate to our wives in a considerate way. So the command that's unique in 1 Peter for husbands is to be considerate. And the unique command for wives is found in chapter 3, verse 1, where we read this. It says, wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. So the unique command for wives in 1 Peter is be submissive. Now, at the foundation of all Christian relationships is this idea of mutual submission. Ephesians 5.21 says this, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And the word submit that's used here, it means to, to yield to or to be subject to or to arrange under. It means that we approach each other with an attitude that says, I'm willing to put your interest first and mine second. I'm willing to think of you first and then think of me second. And so this attitude of mutual submission, this should be the foundation for all of our relationships. And so certainly it should be the foundation in our marriage. And this is true and this is biblical. And when it comes to the topics of marriage and submission in the Bible, we would like to park it right there and just leave it there. Mutual submission, end of discussion. But an honest reading of the Bible reveals that built upon this attitude of mutual submission is a submission that is unique to wives in the context of marriage. As we just read, it says, wives in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. And we don't like what the Bible has to say here. We don't like it, and part of that is because we misunderstand its meaning. But another part of that is that even once we do understand it, there's still some things that we just don't like. And so what does this command mean? Well, first of all, let's look at what it does not mean. This command does not mean that wives should ever put loyalty to their husbands ahead of loyalty to Christ. In fact, this whole section is addressed to women whose husbands are not believers. And this would have been highly unusual at the time that this was written for a wife to have a different religion than her husband. But Peter expects them to remain loyal to Christ. And that's because, as we've talked about earlier, we will all be accountable to God for our own decisions and for our own actions. But then what does this verse mean? What does it mean? Well, it does mean for wives to recognize that your husband has a unique accountability before God and conduct yourself in a way that will help him succeed in his responsibility. I'll read that one more time. It says, to recognize that your husband has a unique accountability before God and conduct yourself in a way that will help him succeed in his responsibility. So how can a wife do this? How can she conduct herself in a way to help her husband succeed in his responsibility? Well, two things. One is to choose encouragement over nagging. Just as husbands are to choose kind words over harsh words, so also wives are to choose encouraging words over nagging words. And so you might say, well, if I don't pester him, he won't do anything. But the truth is that one authentic, well-timed word of encouragement will do more to influence a husband than a hundred nagging words. In fact, nagging words, they really tend to be counterproductive and have a counterproductive result in men. They tend to deflate a man's courage over time, and men tend to recoil at nagging. Now, they may do the specific thing that they're being pressured about. In fact, it's likely 
that they'll do the specific thing that they're being pressured about, but it contributes over time to them pulling back, not just from the responsibility, but from the one who is doing the pressuring. And so rather than ask, how can I drive him to responsibility? Instead ask, how can I draw him to responsibility? And realize that drawing him to responsibility requires choosing an approach of encouragement over an approach of nagging. The second way that a wife can help her husband succeed is to choose faith over fear. A fear response to a husband who isn't acting on his responsibility is to take the responsibility for him. The thought is, if I don't do it, no one will. And you know what? That might actually be true. That might be true. But it is also true that if you do take his responsibility, then he will never feel the full weight of the consequence of giving it up. So a fear response says, I'm going to do my responsibility and I'm going to do his. Whereas a faith response says, I'm going to do my responsibility with absolute faithfulness and I'm going to give him room to do his. And I'm going to trust God with the results. Peter's instructions to husbands and to wives, it boils down to instructions on how to have a different kind of marriage, a marriage that is growing in holiness. And one of the amazing things about this passage, about his instructions, about a marriage that's growing in holiness is that the very same things that grow our marriage in holiness are also an incredible blessing to our spouse. A wife blesses her husband when she encourages him and when she draws him toward responsibility. And a husband blesses his wife when he values her and is considerate of her. And all of these things honor God. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you took our sin, you took what we had deserved, and you paid for that, and you gave us holiness that we could never have earned. You gave us, um, you gave us holiness, and you made us right before you. And so we can have a relationship with you, and we actually can become like you. Thank you, God, for removing that barrier that we could never have removed on our own. And God, I pray that in light of that, that you would give us marriages that are different, that are, are different from what they would be if you were not the number one factor in our lives. And God, I pray that you would do more in our marriages than we could ever do on our own and that we would truly honor you um, through that. And God, I pray that for Seabreeze specifically, that the marriages that are, are represented by the, the people who are part of Seabreeze would be an incredible blessing to the next generation. Um, to those who are our students and our children. I pray that, um, that this would be a context where the students and children would be able to thrive and come to know you and serve you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I hope you found the message to be really helpful for you. After the final song, the three questions will come on the screen. And I encourage you to discuss them then. Now let's sing one more song together. No other hiding place Our hope is safe within your name This we know This we know You promise never to forsake What you begin you will sustain This we know we know I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to save rise your shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain of the heavens and the earth announce the fullness of your word 
This we know, this we know. And every enemy will flee as we declare your victory. This we know, this we know. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call His name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. In every chain, I will go, I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Thank you so much for joining us. You guys have a great week.